So I'm Kira, and I'm here to talk about Alamosa, my tiered disk cache project for NetBSD, which is also my very first block driver ever. So it's been an adventure. So the problem is pretty simple. You know, you can buy a 20 terabyte disk these days for like 350 bucks, and it will do a grand total of like 40 IO operations per second, maybe 100 if you're really lucky. On the other hand, we have really astoundingly fast flash, and we have Optane, which is non-flash, which does even higher numbers. And with that, well, you're going to be paying three times, five times, maybe 10 times in the case of Optane as much per gigabyte. Um, the easy answer to this problem is just cut your workload into pieces, put the cold parts on the cold disk, put the hot parts on the hot disk, make it so that you don't need to worry about this. The problem is that in real applications, it's not always that obvious, especially in advance. If you have a database with 100 tables and 10 million records, you are not necessarily going to be able to divide those in advance onto a cold portion and a hot portion. With that in mind, there's been a few attempts at doing good disk caches to address this problem in the past. Linux has bcache, which I am very favorably impressed with. Um, Kent Overstreet is a brilliant person. If I can get a tiny fraction of the functionality that Bcache has, I will be happy and consider Alamos to be a success. Uh, other than that, there's some other stuff like ZFS has some capabilities that are mostly oriented toward writes as far as I can tell, like the intent log. And that's not really what I'm going for here. Obviously, no disrespect to ZFS. I think it's amazing, but it wasn't really what I was looking for for this specific problem. The other aspect of this is, of course, I've always sort of wanted to write a device driver, specifically a block driver. And I was like, what the heck? You know, it's it's right here. I finally have an excuse. So I went ahead and started it, having only a slight idea of what I was getting into. So the workloads that I was specifically intending to target with this are on an, actually the server components for an embedded device. This is going to include metadata. It's going to include public key information because it's a communicating device that uses cryptographic keys to authenticate communication. And it's also going to be things like profiling information and firmware images. So it's a decent variety of data, um, but it's mostly going to be reads. Like I would not be surprised if it's 95% reads. I would not be shocked if it's 99% reads. That's not to say that I didn't care at all about write performance. I would like to have good write performance on this but it wasn't really what I initially designed it for. And it was one of those things that I initially wrote for me. And the design shows that, and that's something that I'm wanting to address as we go. So I've been thinking about this for a year, year and a half. And at first I chased myself in circles around weird block designs, like, you know, what if we treat the entire disk as a linked list with, mappings of least recently used information? What if we have all of these fancy free space management solutions? Basically, I was thinking about it like I was designing a file system. And then I realized, no, it's a cache. Like my background is embedded devices. I think a lot about hardware cache design. And I realized, no, I can throw all of that out. I'm not intending to build Alamosa FS here. I'm intending to build just a disk cache. So with that in mind, I can treat the entire disk as lines as cache lines and various degrees of validity. I don't have to really do persistent tracking of least recently used across a billion lines. All I really need to track is what is clean, what is dirty, what is valid. That's pretty simple. So what I ended up with is this. This is the original Alamosa. It's since been superseded by a new design but it's the one that is the most in existence today. The disk is divided cleanly into two sections, a metadata section and a line section. The cache lines are eight sequential blocks brought in from the slow disk to the fast disk. And each of those is referred to by a 64-bit descriptor, which lives in the metadata block. So a metadata block has those descriptors. So it's eight bytes each. So for the 512-byte metadata block, you're describing 64 eight block lines of actual disk data. This is pretty dense. It means that we're only spending 
you know, 0.2% of the disk on metadata. I hope the math is right. I just did that in my head. Um, the metadata line is simple. It's eight bytes. We keep 60 bits of disk address. That's the block address of the lowest block in the line. We keep two bits reserved. I am kind of intending to use those later for least recently used information. And then we keep two additional bits for valid and for dirty. So the nifty thing about having a valid bit, which initially I didn't have, is that we can just zero out a volume and have it actually be a valid Alamosa disk, because that just means that it has no valid lines on it. It's still a valid cache, just not one with anything in it. As a result, we don't really have to do any fancy initialization. There's no super block. The disadvantage of some of this is that this is the way this is written really assumes that it's going to be on a raw disk and there's not really support for slices right now, but it works. Um, the metadata lives entirely on the initial portion of the fast disk and it's contagious with itself. The metadata is actually small enough that you could probably load all of it into RAM in some workload scenarios. That's not really something that I've explored support for, but I think I would like to at some point, because there are definitely situations where it is largely bound by the latency of reading to and writing or reading from and writing to the metadata. So the way this works, we do a hash. Uh, we get a single number out, which is an index into both. So if it's in the third line, it's going to be in the first metadata block, third entry. Um, the reason we're storing lines is because in reality, access patterns tend to be at least partially sequential, not fully random. And that means we can greatly conserve disk space. We can use almost no metadata to cache a very large amount of data if we're willing to do a line-based approach. The number eight was not particularly picked by any kind of aggressive quantitative analysis, but I think that it's one that generally does work. And if in the future, it's going to be a little bit more configurable. So I want to touch briefly on the hash question. Right now, this is a trivial hash. It's not a particularly good one. It doesn't give as random of a distribution as I would like. The good news is that that's a single line macro. The bad news is that there are probably situations right now where the hash behavior is not perfect. I didn't really want to overthink that one when I was designing it. At some point, I'll probably just bring in a fast non-cryptographic hash for that. So here's the flow. We get our buffer, our IO device, or our IO descriptor. Then for each line in it, we check the metadata on the fast disk. If we have it, then it's easy. We just call NetBSD's VOP strategy function on the fast disk on the um, correct line. If not, life gets a little bit more complicated and actually I'm simplifying it a little bit in this diagram. So we check the metadata for that block. If it's dirty, we send it back to the slow disk and we wait. Then we get a new line. Well, actually first we zero out the metadata. We mark it not valid. We get a new line, we write the line out and then we update the metadata with a valid bit. Then we call VOP strategy. So that's blocking. Uh, right now, there's not even really a uh, way to do background flashes of dirty lines, which means this is one of the reasons that writes are really, really not well catered to in this design, is that that should be handled with a lightweight process, and it isn't. Like, that should be eagerly sent back to the slow disk when it is first written, rather than blocking when it's evicted. I'll get there. So on the subject of implementation, there's been a couple of generations of different disk and block IO interfaces. Um, CGD implements a new one. And from my understanding, it was actually responsible for a lot of why those new interfaces exist. I don't fully implement those. I implement them to the very limited extent that CCD does. There's also kernel auto configuration and I should be supporting that and I don't. The fact is right now, this gets entirely driven and configured through IOCTLs, through a utility called ALM Util, which is gross, but work in progress, right? Um, so as for CCD, 
I rolled with that because I saw a spiritual kinship with what it's doing. For those not familiar, CCD is the concatenating disk driver. It's a very old driver, dates from the mid 90s from my understanding. Its job is to simply do multiple disks into one disk or one virtual disk, either on an interleaved or sequential arrangement. It's pretty cool, uh, but it doesn't implement the newer interfaces that you see in like CGD and some of the others. So that's something that I'm adapting for going forward. But yeah, as is, like this thing does not come up automatically when the system starts. It's IOCTLs all the way down. So as for actually designing and testing this, it's been a, uh, this is something also that I did not handle as well as I should have. There's been a lot of manual build, test, crash the kernel, spend 10 minutes waiting for FS check to fix the FFS volume, make a tweak and do it again. It would have been really nice if I could just do rump kernels for this because NetBSD provides very nice rump kernel functionality for almost exactly this kind of project, but I didn't. Like I got started down the road of the artisanally crafted by monks approach to building and testing this driver. And as a result, it was always a ceremony to test it and run it. That probably cost like 60% of the time of developing it. So as I've alluded to, there are some limitations with this design. It's direct mapped. That is for each hash, there is only one line corresponding to that hash. This means that if you have hash collisions, there's automatic eviction. So if you have a particularly pathological workload approach where you have two frequent accesses resolving to the same line on that hash, then you're just stuck in this cycle of constant bring in and evict, bring in and evict, bring in and evict, and it potentially completely eats your performance. This is not great. Uh, before I mentioned CPU caches, direct mapped caches exist on CPUs, but only on the lowest of the low end. And they've been mostly going the way of the dodo for the last 15 to 20 years in favor of associative caches. The other aspect of this is none of this was written to be tunable. It's it, everything is hard coded as constants. You cannot change the line size. You cannot change the eviction behavior. It was built specifically to implement one style of caching, and it's not really built to anything else. The implementation quality is not amazing. Uh, it was my first block driver ever. I basically wrote it until it mostly worked and then kind of stopped. It doesn't do kernel auto configuration, like I mentioned. So you're right back there with the IOCTLs. It doesn't play nice with any of the very well thought out interfaces for doing that, even though it would fit well into them. And right back, like I mentioned, there should be a lightweight process querying queues for this. When you write, you should be adding that line to the queue and then a lightweight process should write it back in the background. Write performance obviously was never a priority. The assumption here with the original one was we are going to be caching roughly the same set of lines overall which could be argued misses the point of the entire project to begin with. So we go back to redesign. Alamosa 2, this is the one where it starts to get serious and hopefully not terrible. The direct mapped cache where there's one hash per line and if it collides, then you evict it, that's gone. We're bringing in an associative cache that is we store multiple lines or multiple ways is the correct term in the uh, in the same corresponding to the same hash. So that means there's no longer automatic eviction. And I want to make that associativity configurable. What I've been thinking is actually between two and 16 lines. The trade-off there is just that if you have more, you potentially end up spending more resources looking for which one corresponds to your hash or to your specific address, they all correspond to the same hash. As to eviction policy, this is something that there's been a lot of research on by people a lot smarter than me. The correct way to do this arguably is to do it as a 
least recently used where you track which time or how recently each of the lines in that set has been used. And then you evict the one that is the oldest. The problem there is you have to do a lot of tracking for it, uh, whether that means persistent tracking on the disk metadata or in memory. So what I settled on is modified random. Basically, we track the most recently used one, and then we kick out a random one of the other three if you're doing a four-way associativity. And that way, you're not going to be kicking out a brand new hot line from the cache, even if you do have to bring in a new one. So it's not perfect, but it's the best of limited options on that front. I thought a lot about adding least recently used information to the metadata, but my conclusion was that that would blow out the number of metadata rights for like a 0.1% improvement in hit rate. And that's not worth it. That's the numbers don't add up for that. I can revisit that if it comes down to it. Obviously there's gonna have to be a certain amount of tuning and this is something that isn't stable or frozen yet. So there will assuredly be changes to all of this before I end up having the upstream conversation. So here's our new structure. We've got one hash corresponding to a set of four different lines, which can have four different addresses. So like I mentioned, the previous issue where you're potentially evicting overly aggressively goes away. If you have a hot one, it will never be kicked out. If the bottom one is hot, you're going to pick one of the top three to eject, and then they, one of those goes away to make room for the new line that you're bringing in. Then there's the question of new driver features. So number one is proper kernel auto configuration. I should have had this from day one. I didn't really feel like understanding how it worked in addition to understanding how the block device APIs work, but I understand how it works now and it is not particularly scary. And it will be nice not to have to deal with running ALM util to create a new cache device whenever I want to test something or want to use something. Like I mentioned, I want to have a lightweight process doing right back. Uh, I don't want to have this thing where we just block on the entire cache device if we're doing an eviction because that's terrible and that kills any performance we gain from caching. I also want to have some kind of flexible locking situation. What I've been experimenting with on this front is that we have an internal in-memory cache structure, if you will, of X locks each referring to a given address range in the cache. So you can do a fine-grained lock of one thirty-second of the cache while it's writing back. This means you don't have to individually track every write back going on. But on the downside, it means that you're limited by the number of distinct locks you have allocated. Like if you have 1,024, you probably will not have a whole lot of problems with that. If you have four, you might have a few. Right now, there's effectively one in the current implementation. So any improvement is a win. The trick that I want to pull off at some point is to have configuration determined automatically or near automatically, where you will put the cache into a special mode. You'll run your workload on it, and it will do various tests of different configurations, that is line length, that is associativity, and then it will generate a profile that seems to correspond well to that. I'm really excited about that possibility. I don't know how much it will buy in practice, but my guess is that it will end up considerably more optimal than any kind of standard defaults, even good ones. So I'm really excited about that. Um, higher associativity, like I mentioned before, you improve your hit rate potentially, but there's then the trade-offs of how much CPU you spend going through those lines looking for the one that corresponds to your current address. You know, if you do 1,024 of those, that starts to be a problem, not least because then you're spending two metadata blocks on it. So line size, this depends on the workload. If your workload is like pure random, you might even get gains from a one block line. That means that you're spending a ton of disk space on metadata. I would be surprised if there are a lot of workloads that would benefit from going all the way down to one. I could see workloads going down to two blocks per line. I could see them going up to a thousand if they're ones that have bursty writes. So 
So obviously this has been an exciting process. I've learned some lessons from it. Number one lesson, use rump kernels. Like I mentioned, having to debug it the way I was debugging it is painful. And there's no good reason to do it that way, except, well, I started doing it this way and now there's the sunk cost fallacy. So if you can use rump kernels, great for this. They should be usable. Uh, driver testing as part of where the rump kernel subsystem exists. And then if you can, script a VM, generate it from an image, run through your tests and generate a report. Don't bring it up in interactive mode and poke at it and prod at it and be shocked when it crashes. Don't expect to save your disk volume. Assume that it's going to fry it every time. Test early and test often. You don't want to throw away 700 lines of kernel code because you screwed something up and you didn't catch it until late. That's happened to me twice. Automate everything you can. There's no unit testing here. I wish there was. I think it's kind of a hard thing to unit test conceptually. And I think that unit testing in kernel mode is kind of hard to begin with, but it's something where it would make my life sufficiently easier to probably be worth it at some point down the road. And well, if simply doing a test of a code change is a large ritual in your day, you're probably not doing it very well. So I would like to get this upstream one day. It's going to be a minute. Um, I would like to have this running in production before I even start thinking about that. If it eats data, I don't want to even be talking about upstream. I want to actually throw real workloads on it on two different platforms. In my case, that probably means x86 and PowerPC. And I want to have it doing that in real live situations for a period of months. And I want to also like stress test it. I want to do torture testing on this. And then after it's been deeply tested, I want to be thinking about performance characterization and then I can call the design done. Performance characterization is gonna be kind of a tough one. Thankfully, there are abundant tools on the market for disk um, performance analysis. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't really match up well to real workloads and the only real workloads I have are the ones that I run. I don't necessarily know what somebody else's workload is going to look like. So once that's all happy, let's talk about upstream. Um, that's gonna be early 2025, hopefully. I'm hoping to have a source code release in late 2024 that people can start looking at. That's gonna be once the design is frozen though. I'm unlikely to uh, really be inclined to release source code prior to that. I don't want to see uh, people looking at my embarrassing early design failures really. Maybe they would be educational in a way. I've got some other stuff going on in my NetBSD branch that aren't really relevant, but they're being designed at the same time and built at the same time and probably will be upstreamed around the same time. So I'm bringing them up anyway. One of those is dual kernel real time. Uh, if you're familiar with Xenomai on Linux, the general gist here is that you run a real time operating system kernel and then you run your Unix or Linux kernel as a task under that real-time operating system. So you can do real-time scheduling outside of the Unix bubble. And then you usually also import all of the real-time APIs to support that. So you get your fixed length queues and your other fancy real-time stuff. And the other thing that I'm working on in this tree is Itanium fixes. Um, for this project, there's Itanium servers in the rack and we would like to have NetBSD running on this, especially given the unfortunate uh, removal of Itanium support from Linux. I'd also really like to see NVMM running on that, but there's no QEMU support for Itanium right now. So the rest of the platform emulation would be difficult, but cross that bridge when we get there. My thinking is that all of these will probably have upstream patches in um, early 2025, maybe mid, if it ends up slipping. So I think I got through that a little faster than I was hoping for, but uh, if anybody has any questions, I would love to help answer them. I feel like you can definitely hear you. Sorry if I need to be seen. Hello. <laughs> you're, you're in the frame. I, I see myself there now. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. That's interesting. To, um, 
how or are you handling um, like trim and discard? So if I put in a chunky NVMe cache device, I'm probably going to want to flush it out from time to time. So I can't so quite see how you do that with that without a full scan. I have no particular fancy support for that right now. Uh, right now, the assumption is that we do write back immediately. In the future, write back is going to be queued. Um, if and when there is a full uh, write back everything mode in ALM util or in any other portion of it, it's going to end up doing a full scan. Yep. Okay. Incoming. Hello. <laughs> uh, so uh, as for the design, uh, you're using LRU. Uh, not sure if you consider using something like uh, ZFS arc or the or ZFS some, uh, somehow uh, balance between the most frequently used and most recently used queues. So we plug those yep. two lists uh, and it's actually, uh, it's like two dimensional, right? So it's uh, yep. so it prevents like you have like a one full scan of your storage, and basically you throw away all the cache, right? So, and this uh, most uh, frequently used queue allows you to avoid uh, getting rid of all your cache and just balance those two together. So the problem with doing most frequently used on this, uh, which I sort of alluded to when I was talking about random eviction rather than full LRU, is that I'd prefer not to have to track the frequency of use of every single line, if at all possible. I'd prefer to keep that to every single set rather than all of the lines within it. If there's enough of a win from that, I would be uh, certainly willing to explore that. But so far, it hasn't looked to me like there's a significant win for doing um, more advanced approaches to eviction than just straight up hot plus random. So at the, I think at the top of uh, this ARC implementation for ZFS, there, are, there is a reference to the uh, paper describing this method and probably some results. So maybe mm -hmm. for version three, that would be mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always wanting to improve this. Uh, obviously, it's been a learning experience as I go. I did not go into this with deep expertise on disk caches. I'm sure you hear Corbin. I'm on one of the directors of NetBSD. So thank you for that. And my question is, why did you choose NetBSD for this project? So there's a couple aspects here. Um, I really like working with the NetBSD kernel. It's not particularly scary. It's uh, It moves at its own pace, which is something that I like. It's not something that has been particularly dictated by what is commercially viable today. It's something that keeps platform support, which is big for me as somebody who's running Itanium systems. Really, I like NetBSD. It, the thing that first got me into it way back when was reading the rump kernel stuff. I think there was an original paper on that that I read and I was like, whoa, this is magic. And then ever since then, I've sort of wanted to find occasion to write something for NetBSD and now I am. Anyone else? You mentioned that uh, you would get this upstream by 2025. Uh, so it looks like your all your work is done, right? Why would it take that long? It's just not done. Um, the Alamosa 2, de two design is like, it's mostly done. It has not been stress tested. It has not been frozen. And it probably won't be my top priority again until August because I have another project that has a due date. I think that if I'm lucky, like first month or two of 2025, and like I said, I'll, I'm hoping to have a source release later this year as soon as the design is approximately frozen. When, when you do finish, right, uh, and when you are attempting to upstream, do you have to give proof of correctness? Uh, to get this merge? How does this usually work when you're trying to- I haven't to looked closely at that yet, except that I'm going to have to have a uh, sign off from somebody with 
you may have access and presumably with familiarity with that subsystem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll thank everybody for uh, for watching and for the good questions. I hope that it was informative. I'll have the stream for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.